Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and I wanted to highlight a June battle in one of my animated battle maps, and I chose one of, if not the very first, battle of the American Civil War. Some people claim other battles as the first, but many associate the first engagement of the war with the Battle of Big Bethel. When Abraham Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers to suppress the rebellion in the southern states after the Confederacy fired on Fort Sumter, the Upper South began to secede, including Virginia. The Old Dominion left the Union on April 17, 1861. Its state militia formed the foundation for the state's armed forces, and when it seceded, many of those militia units were converted into Virginia's army. Federal forts and installations were then captured by state forces and put under control of the state of Virginia. However, one prominent fort resisted attempts by the state to capture it, Fort Monroe. It sat on the peninsula in Virginia, created by the York and James Rivers poured into the Chesapeake Bay. In May, Benjamin Butler, a Democrat from Massachusetts, gained appointment as a general in the Union Army and was assigned to command Fort Monroe. By the beginning of June, Butler had over 3,500 men and was pushing up the peninsula. Major General Robert E. Lee, now in command of the armed forces for the state of Virginia, was concerned about the pressure from Fort Monroe and the possibility of it threatening the capital. Colonel John B. Magruder was sent by Lee to push back the Union forces emerging from Fort Monroe. Magruder set up defenses around Yorktown. However, he lacked a good map, but found an antiquated one provided by the grandson of George Washington's chief surgeon that depicted the old Revolutionary War entrenchments. The British fortifications made up the left of the Confederate line. Virginia and North Carolina troops, as well as local slaves dispatched by their owners, helped dig rifle pits and trenches for the Confederate Army. While digging, they found cartridge boxes, ammunition, and bones left from the war that happened 80 years before. In late May and into early June, Butler began sending his troops further up the peninsula. The 5th and 2nd New York Infantry Regiments ventured to Hampton, then about halfway between Yorktown and Fort Monroe, near Bethel. A church sat at Big Bethel called the Bethel Church. The New Yorkers occupied the area and even wrote things on the walls of the church, like death to traitors. Magruder sent two regiments and a conglomeration of other units to Bethel. Colonel Daniel Harvey Hill commanded the 1st North Carolina, sent to defend their sister state, Virginia. The 3rd Virginia was the other regiment, and they were followed by the Peninsula Cavalry under John Bell Hood and the Richmond Howitzers commanded by President Thomas Jefferson's youngest grandson, George With Randolph, just to name a few. Hill and Magruder found the church abandoned and began building earthworks on the hill on which it sat, overlooking a creek, as well as building some earthworks on the south side of the creek. Advance guards were sent south to Little Bethel, while the main force stayed at Big Bethel. Butler planned for 3,500 men under the command of Ebenezer Pierce to push up the peninsula and capture the Confederate forces that had come out of Yorktown and taken up a position at Big Bethel. The Union troops began their march on the night of June 9, 1861. Butler created a password so that the new recruits and inexperienced officers wouldn't fire on one another in the dark. About 4 a.m., the 3rd New York received gunfire as they approached the Confederate position at Little Bethel, but it wasn't rebel bullets that flew through the air. It was ammunition from the rifles of the 7th New York. The password had not been distributed to all of the units, and the 3rd New York wore gray uniforms. This caused confusion in the ranks, and it also alerted the small Confederate force at Little Bethel that Union troops were on their way, and they evacuated their position. Magruder had prepared his men to launch their own attack, but when he heard the gunfire, he was alerted that the Union force was only a short distance away. He brought his men back into the entrenchments. Magruder's men looked over their ramparts and could see Union infantry forming up just to the south. The 3rd and 5th New York Infantry Regiments came into view. Within the fortifications surrounded the church were four cannons. On the right was a 10-pound Parrot rifle. Its accuracy had been displayed at the Virginia Military Institute right before the conflict erupted, and the state of Virginia was able to order 12 of them for state use before the war prevented them from ordering more from the Northern Factory. At a little after 9 a.m., the Parrot rifle was fired, and the Battle of Big Bethel began. The shot slammed into the ground in front of the 5th New York and ricocheted through their ranks, producing a few casualties. The two sides exchanged cannon volleys, and then Pierce ordered the 5th New York to move up the road and attack the advanced rebel fortifications on the south side of the creek. 
Captain Judson Kilpatrick was in this charge and became wounded when a rifle bullet ricocheted off one man's shoulder, penetrated another man's leg, and smashed into Kilpatrick's upper thigh. Doggedly, the captain charged on. The situation became dire for the Confederates in the forward emplacement when a soldier put the friction primer into the vent hole of the artillery piece before the cartridge was rammed home. This momentarily disabled the howitzer. Magruder ordered the units back to the main line and the troops hid the disabled cannon in the swamp as they retreated. The New Yorkers had successfully captured the small eminence in front of the Confederate main line. D.H. Hill became concerned that the Union may place a cannon in that emplacement and gain an advantage, so he sent Company A, still on the south side of the creek, to attack the lone Union regiment. After a brave firefight, the North Carolinians were able to push the Yankees back. One Confederate described it as such, The Zouaves rushed right upon our works and stood fire remarkably well, but when the rate of fire increased from the rebel guns, they broke and ran like sheep. After all, he thought to himself, they can neither shoot nor ride. They are footmen and menial by nature. Stubbornly, the New Yorkers withdrew to a safe distance from the Confederate cannon rifle fire. With the threat contained, Magruder sent additional troops to support Hill's men, as well as a reserve artillery piece. It had been Butler's plan for Pierce to take the Confederate position by bayonet charge, but the reality of the situation set in for Pierce, and he realized that it would take a flanking maneuver to dislodge the Confederates. So Pierce chose the 3rd New York to perform this flanking maneuver. However, orders got misinterpreted and the New Yorkers stepped off on the same trajectory as the 5th New York before them. However, at least part of the regiment understood that they were to flank the enemy and split from their regiment. The Colonel, Frederick Townsend, did not notice their detachment and those left companies moved northwest to attack Magruder's men from the west. Townsend looked across the stream, saw the gleam of bayonets from his own regiment and ordered his men to fall back, thinking that the Confederates had attempted to outflank him. This left those companies across the stream abandoned, and they were obliged to fall back with the rest of the regiment. Meanwhile, the Yankee sharpshooters in the Mitchell House were playing havoc with the rebel defenders. D.H. Hill begrudgingly ordered the house burned. Six Confederates climbed over the breastworks, and about 30 yards away from their target, a volley ripped into them, killing Henry L. Wyatt the only Confederate to be killed as a result of the engagement. The men scrambled back to their fortifications, but a shell from a Confederate howitzer did their job for them by crashing through a window of the house and setting the structure ablaze. As the house burned, the Union commander formed up the 7th New York and elements of the 1st Vermont and 4th Massachusetts to attack the Confederate left, while the 1st and 2nd New York distracted the advanced Confederate position. Magruder, anticipating a flanking maneuver happening, sent part of his defenders to the east to block the Yankees from turning his flank. The men from Vermont, Massachusetts, and New York stepped off and made it to the creek, separating them from the main Confederate line. The Union troops lifted their rifles, cartridge boxes, and cap boxes over their heads to wade across the creek, then climbed up the steep wooded bank on the other side. Major Theodore Winthrop was in this group of men, however he had no command. He had begged Butler to join in the advance against the Confederates at Big Bethel, and Butler gave in. Once across the creek, Winthrop led the Union men up the slope. He stepped onto a log, and with his sword raised, he yelled, Rally, boys, rally! Come on, boys, one more charge, and the day is ours. At that moment, a bullet pierced his upper torso. He died in the arms of Private John M. Jones from Vermont. After this third attack failed, the Union army withdrew from the field, unable to budge the defenders from Big Bethel. The Union lost 76 men, 18 killed, 53 wounded, and 5 missing. The Confederacy lost 10 men total, 1 man killed, and 9 wounded. Although it wasn't a large battle by Civil War standards, the Battle of Big Bethel signaled the beginning of hostilities for many Americans, especially the men involved in the engagement. It has a right to claim to be the first land battle of the American Civil War. Although other small engagements took place before it, many historians label them as mere skirmishes, while the Battle of Big Bethel was the first actual battle. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far, far from home. Have history will travel, he's the card of a man. A professor with knowledge in the heart. 
Historian, historian.